Okay, so continuing with detailing here on the head. Um, like I said, I'm kind of using that clay tubes brush just to kind of refine the forms a little bit. This is a very intuitive part. I mean, I, I, I can't say precisely why I like to do it this way. It just, to me, it feels natural to kind of really build out those forms, make it look a little bit less like I'm digging in and drawing lines in the surface and more like there's an actual change to the forms, if that makes any sense. But um, you can see if I'm doing a little bit of smoothing here, it kind of, it creates a little bit of a surface tension in there. You know, I mean, I like to sort of imply, you know, the, the way that exoskeletons grow, it's like, you know, it's basically an exoskeleton of an insect and a lot of arthropods is made up of a substance called chitin, which is kind of like, you know, it's similar to like your fingernails, you know, you know, and then, um, so the cells kind of uh, secrete them in a way and build up this little plate of chitinous material. And I think in that process, it's nice to have sort of imply that kind of stretching and tension with these very like micro lines underneath the surface. So you can see, I don't want to make them too regular because it's going to look bizarro, but you can see it's got kind of this stretchy quality to it. So I'm just kind of smoothing that and then going down here and down here is kind of nice too, just to do this. Here. Now it depends on how much we want to do in the back and how much we want to do down here. This is, of course, a big mystery section because it's covered up by the mouth parts usually. This mo model I haven't done the mouth parts on like I have on the other one. I'll probably do a kind of a Frankenstein combination of that because I think the mouth parts and the scan on this one are kind of gnarly. So that's something that uh, mouth parts is something that I'm very interested in right now with bees, especially comparing something like an orchid bee to a honey bee because. The mouth part for honeybee is like our hands, you know, it's what they do a lot of their work, um, especially when it comes to building the hive and all that kind of stuff, chewing through wax, you know, then you have leaf cutter bees, just like you have leaf cutter ants and stuff like that. And so, um, so I wanted to model some super accurate um, mouth parts. And of course, it's one of those things that turned out to be a much bigger project than I thought because I had to work off of a lot of either grainy f pictures or um, diagrams or even if you can get a bee under a microscope even then you're still looking at twisted dead mangled stuff so it's a real interesting modeling and rigging challenge but challenges are fun <coughs> spending some time you know Learning, you know, if you're a creature modeler, it's never a bad idea to go and, and do just as a study an accurate insect model as, as much as you can. Sorry, that shocked me there. Um, it's just a great study. And, um, you know, just trying to be, just like you would with human anatomy, we all want to try and be accurate with human anatomy. Well, we should try and do that with insects and all, all animals. Um, you know, we're always biased towards mammals because they make the most sense, but I find insects interesting because it's a completely different world. You have the muscles on the inside, and so it's a completely different way to detail these things. You have the skeleton on the outside, right? Exoskeleton. So you learn a lot of interesting things that you can apply to creature designs. You know, the more you do, of course, the more that you uh, build up this sort of subconscious library of ideas that you can pull out the next time you're doing an alien um, for whatever reason it's just kind of another visual language that you can work on okay so I mean I this is obviously something I can do all day, all day long but I want to kind of make sure I get more stuff covered okay so now that sort of under undercurrent of wobbly detail see how it's just not perfect 
surface. I mean, it almost looks like the striations you'd see on like a muscle or something like that, which is fine. So now what I want to do is I want to create another level of surface detail here on top of what I've already done. So I might, um, let's mask this area right here underneath the eye. So again, we could play around with the surface noise uh, plugin, which is one of my favorite parts in ZBrush. I use it all the time. Just to create a little bit more interesting um, surface. And again, if I'm looking at like the orchid bee or other types of insects, like a weevil or something like that, you might have very, you know, what's the personality, the detail that we're looking at? Is it regular dots pitting that where all the pits are about the same size and they're evenly spaced? Is there a variety? Is it more of kind of like a noise, um, a random noise? Or I think with honeybees, it's going to be kind of a, you know, a sort of a noise pattern that is not super evenly spaced, but not also completely random at the same time, if that makes any sense. So. I'm just going to mask this area and then let's mask this here too. I'm not going to worry about the back of the head so much. Okay, so let's say that. And then I'll go in here to surface noise. Surface noise and we're nice and zoomed in. So this is kind of the default noise right here. Not a bad place to start. I mean, you have that kind of interesting pitting. I like to play with the graph here a little bit, see if I can exaggerate it at all. Like this is not what I want. That's not, not quite the detail I'm looking for. Maybe something like this, now that's starting to look a bit more like what I often see in close-ups of exoskeletons, that kind of quality to it. So let's see, make it a little bit exaggerated because we can always smooth it out a bit. Something like that. So I could go in here and then I have this kind of overall noise. Now remember if I'm using the surface noise and it's on, it's not actually applied to the geometry yet. Um, here's with it off, here's with it on. So there's a couple things I could do here to make this interesting. I could just do like apply to mesh. So now it's actually applied to the surface. And maybe what I'll go in here and do, it, what I'll do is go in here and maybe smooth some parts. Because the other thing is I don't want, you know, perfectly evenly you know I want a variety in or a contrast in the way that the noise affects the surface another way of looking at this is if you think about you know maybe some of these areas are a bit smoother where it might be a little bit more worn away um, oops. let me uh, lose the live stream here real quick I stopped it and restarted it, so. Okay. Okay, sorry, we had to stop and restart the uh, restart the stream, stream, so hopefully that's not causing too many problems. This is a quick technical issue. moment to have a sip of beer.
So just kind of doing a little bit of smoothing here um, to vary the intensity across the surface. Another thing you can do is you can, instead of applying it, you could do mask by noise. So that's just creating a mask. I'm going to hide the mask and maybe go in here with say like maybe, I don't know, the inflate brush at a very low Z intensity and just kind of go across the surface. So now I'm just taking advantage of that mask or you could even do an invert inflate. So I'm doing holding the alt key in this case. Yeah, that's okay. But you can see how I'm getting a little bit of a different quality here from the mask than I am from just applying and smoothing. So it's something I like to experiment with. You can see I can bring up a little bit more intensity there with that inflate brush. And, and this is the kind of detail that I think is really fun to try and experiment with. My hitting is smooth. I'm going to hold the shift key and lower my Z intensity on the smooth brush just so you can see that. So what I'm doing here, and this again, this is all intuition. So I have a mask applied, basically using the surface noise. So I hit control H to hide it. And now I'm using the inflate brush to go over here and take advantage of that mask. And then I'll hit it with the smooth brush. And you can see now this to me looks a lot like what I see on insects close ups, this kind of sort of pitting. De again, depends on the insect. It's going to be different depending on, on you know, the lifestyle of the insect. But that's the kind of detail that I think is really organic and looks really cool. And uh, if you can come and get it to come through in like a displacement map, even better. So I'm just kind of playing with inflating and smoothing and that kind of stuff. Maybe bringing it out here a little bit. And you know, a lot of these techniques that I've developed over the years, a lot of them come from just f messing around. You know what I mean? Um, and just making a mess. I don't like that. Um, and experimenting. And every once in a while you come across something that's really cool you kind of just sort of put it in the back of your mind as a technique something you want to pull out later on in some situations and that's why it's always good to spend time fooling around in zbrush if you're always trying to do something very specific a lot of times it, it can lead to kind of a well you you start to use the same tricks over and over again and, and it's true i use a lot of the same tricks over and over again kind of like a jazz musician, but the more tricks you developed, the more you can vary it. And uh, then depending on the situation, you can pull things out of your hat and see what works for various different types of projects. I hope that makes some kind of sense. So I like smoothing this out because it does make it look a little bit less CG generated. So I'm just using that inflate brush with the mask and Pulling that out and smoothing it, maybe hitting, hitting Alt. Okay, so let's see. I like to do a little bit of inflate here along the edges. You know, anytime we get up to an edge where there's a division between two surfaces, I like to bring up the detail, make it look a little bit more uh, ragged, you know, a little bit more worn, worn out. Okay, sorry if I missed the chat here for a second. I'm going to catch up and see any comments. Okay, cool. Um, you 
Yeah, mantis shrimp. Very, very cool stuff. Never get tired of hearing about that stuff. I haven't done a good man. I haven't done a good study of how mantis eyes work, but I have read a few papers, or I should say, skimmed a few papers. Definitely cool stuff, as they see in, in many different um, areas of the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as you know, 360 degree vision and all that kind of good stuff. And it's wild. Okay, so let's say I have this kind of detail right here, and a control drag to uh, clear the mask. And maybe, you know, pull out the old Damien Standard brush. It's still one of my favorites. And and maybe lower the Z intensity. Just go in here and maybe some fine lines. Let's find a good Z intensity. Okay, that kind of thing. Because um, one thing I do want to avoid is getting too mushy or soft a surface. Even though these are a lot of round surfaces, I'd like to go in here and... Uh, kind of pull them out a little bit using that Damien Standard brush. Let's turn up transparency for a second. You know, because I don't want things to get too mushy. This might be slightly exaggerated in terms of the detail around the eyes. That's okay. Let's either soften it out or you know Sometimes it's good to have a certain amount of exaggeration because if I bring this into another rendering program like, uh, you know, Redshift or Maya or whatever, and I'm using displacement maps, it might be good to have a little bit of exaggeration there, make sure that it comes out. Especially if you end up making a very translucent shader because a translucency will kind of kill some of that detail. If you have a certain amount of specularity on there, obviously, that can work to help to bring the detail out. But a lot of the um, like translucency makes makes detail a little bit harder to see. The other thing that you might have noticed is right now I've got symmetry on, so all my detail is almost perfectly symmetrical. So at a certain point, I'm going to turn symmetry off and start to change some of the surface here so it's not so obviously symmetrical. Um, and I'm just kind of like making little lines, for lack of a better term, around these various parts to kind of uh, give it a, some personality. So I'm just kind of brightly, or so brightly, lightly scuffing across the surface with Damien's standard brush, alternating, holding the Alt key. This is a good example right here. Kind of want to bring this out so it has a bit of a harder edge here and maybe smooth that, some of that detail a little bit because that's the kind of stuff that's going to look really nice and really natural and organic. Um, and this is a good one for the Damien standard brush. Uh, I don't know what's going on with this part of the surface right here. I have to check my reference to see if that's correct. This this detail right here is kind of strange. So what I might do is let's take a look and see why I have that detail. This is also a model that I did a while back. So sometimes I have to remember why I did things the way that I did. So let me take a look at the scan here. I think there is... Yeah, I'm not really seeing that detail in the scan. I think that's something that my brain kind of invented. So here's the mandibles, right? Here's sort of the bottom part of the, of the head. And... Here's my head, so I think... That detail we can get rid of. Some kind of brain fart happened. Let's take a look at some reference. Yeah, okay, I see. I might be missing a piece right here. So you can see where the mandibles come out. So here's the mandibles, right? Edge right here. And then, okay, I see what I was going on going for. Here's our head, and then we have kind of this, and then we have this plate, which I should know the name of probably have it in my notes somewhere but in case we have a division right here so this is something we could either add in with another piece of geometry or sculpt in onto the surface so what I might do 
is let's sculpt it onto the surface for now but I need to fix it because it shouldn't look like this it should be more like straight across and maybe I should pull this down a little bit so make sure there's no masks applied to the head this is why it's good to have levels of subdivision I think it's just something when I was sculpting maybe I got carried away with it and I added some detail that wasn't there so that's why it's always good to remember to double check your reference every once in a while make sure you're not making stuff up unless you want to make stuff up and then it doesn't matter All right. so I'm going to pull this down a little bit it's easy to get carried away with this stuff sometimes but you know I'm just going to soft, uh, smooth it out and SK cloth. And this part's going to be covered with hair too, so let's get that uh, clay tubes going and this up. Or it's like since I was using the surface noise, I can always bring that same noise back because even though the surface noise is turned off, the settings are stored in memory. Sometimes if I come up with a really cool surface noise, I'll actually save the surface noise file because you can copy and paste it to other sub tools, right? So like I might like if I really like the way this looks on the head, I might copy and paste that surface noise settings to say the thorax or the mandibles or something else. So you can kind of just reuse it throughout the uh, throughout the model, and the um, copy and paste controls I'll show you in a second. They're found in the uh, surface noise um, plugin thing. All right, so I'm just going here, and it is. I have a lot of models that I'll start and like literally pick up months and sometimes even years later just because I get busy with work or some other thing and I'm sure this happens to all of you and sometimes you look at your model and you're like what was I thinking where did that detail come from it's very strange do kind of like this kind of turn in the surface here which I think I could be getting more of I kind of don't mind redoing detailing sometimes but if I have to um, I'd rather fix something that's wrong and redo the detail then just try and convince myself that it's okay and live with it because I'm the kind of person I'll just wake up in the middle of the night and be like my bee mouth is wrong and I can't live with it anymore and I'm gonna I won't rest until I fix it that's why I keep redoing these things over and over again the bees are really difficult because they are so familiar and recognizable there's something that looks extremely recognizable at human scale but looks more and more alien the more close you get to it but since we have such a familiarity with them, you know, throughout our lives, we're always dealing with honeybees more often than, say, I don't know, um, trap jaw ants. So, getting a bee to look like a bee, like you want it to look like, is kind of like getting a likeness of a celebrity. It can take some practice to get it to it's where it starts to click and you really feel like, oh yeah, that is the honeybees that I know and love again that's part of the challenge so I'm going to go in here and just smooth this out a little bit let's go down here and smooth this build this up just a little bit more kind of like those lines that are left by that clay tubes brush is something that I kind of like because it like I said, it kind of builds like an undercurrent or a level of detail below the finer detail. All 
There's kind of like a quality here where it's like building up and then going in here. I'm just going to bring up the Z intensity a little bit. I don't like to use a high Z intensity with the clay brushes. I like to keep them low, <coughs> very low Z intensity. There's a very, very old Noman video. I don't know if it's still around anymore. Zach Petrock, and he's using like ZBrush 2 or 2.5 or something like that. And he's doing a human anatomy lesson. It's a really great and inspiring but extremely old ZBrush video. One of the first ZBrush videos. I think one of the first ones that the Noman Workshop did. But everything he does in there with the brushes is just really low Z intensity. So he's just barely moving stuff around. But the result is really nice because he has a lot of control over it that way. As opposed to throwing up the Z intensity really high and then just trying to brute force everything. So you're creating kind of a nice roundness on the surface here that I think looks a little bit better. Um, I'll probably have to check it again to make sure it's accurate with some of my reference. Let me catch up on the... Uh... Hey, Louie. How's it going, man? I enjoyed your fireside, fireside chat, Louie. It's in inspirational. It roasted my chestnuts, if you know what I mean. A lot of people don't know this, but Louis Tucci is actually based on a Marvel character. He's got like a rock band going, he's doing the fireside chats with the Pixelogic, he's teaching the kids a thing or two about the ZBrush and the art. He's got it all, man. acting in movies. He's everywhere. He's the, he's the, uh, Louis Tucci is the it girl, but you know, in guy form. All right. Um, okay. So I just erased a lot of that detail I did before. That's a bummer. That's okay. I don't mind because uh, love of the surface noise, right? So let's go back into surface noise. And see if we can bring some of that stuff back, right? So we'll go into surface, turn on noise, and go in here to edit. So this is what I meant by like copy and paste, right? So I can hit copy right here. And just as an example, I'll turn off the noise for a second. And let's say go to a different sub tool. Let's say the mandibles here. So I'll click on them. Hello, mandibles, wake up. Okay, they don't want to wake up, so I'll just go ahead and do it manually. There we go. Oh, that's right. It's because they're separate subtools. So, for example, I'm going to subdivide this. Whoops, already got subdivisions. Okay, all right. No need to freak out. Get up here. Let's uh, subdivide it a few more times, right? Get it to like a million polygons. And then I can go into surface, turn on, turn on noise, and do paste, right? And um, and that paste that same noise setting from that one sub tool to the other. So it's just a nice handy thing to have. You know, one of my favorite features of surface noise. If you want to get consistent surface noise throughout the surface. And then of course you can also, if you go in here and edit, you could save this as its own noise file so that you can use it in other other projects. So I've applied the noise, but I'm just gonna do mask by noise and hide. So I'm hidden the hide hide hid the mask and now I'm just going to go in here with my uh, inflate brush. You could use other brushes, it doesn't have to be inflate, but um, I like the inflate brush in terms of bringing out that surface noise. So now you can see I just go over this and all that stuff that I lost because I redid that part of the model is no problem because I can bring it back. You know, it's going to be different, but that's okay. So just alternating you know, maybe holding the Alt key again. I like to get on these rough edges here or make it rougher on the edges, more noise on the edges there. Smoother on the flat parts of the surface. And uh, I'll go over here. You also have the noise brush, of course, I, which I tend to use the surface noise as opposed to the noise brush only because I've just developed that habit over the years, but the noise brush is really cool. 
And you can also use the noise brush on top of uh, Mask by Noise. You know, you can combine these things. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you go into the brush palette, and I'll ch choose Noise, this is a brush that has noise built into it, and you can edit that noise by going to the brush palette, going down to Surface, and edit, and lo and behold, we have a interface that's very similar to the one that we see over here. But these settings are different. So I think you can paste these. Yeah, I could even paste these in here into the brush and then use that as opposed to overall surface. So, or in any kind of combination that you want. Um, I'm going to clear that mask, get out my damn standard brush, and just kind of crisp up this stuff a little bit. I think they have a little bit of like crisscrossing to create that kind of detail and hold the alt key and bring this out a little bit. So I'm kind of thinking about, you know, imagine the very edge of your fingernail and what that looks like if you don't take particularly good care of your fingernails. You know, you get that kind of damage kind of stuff. So I'm kind of replicating that here. Thinking, in, you know, these are layers of chitin that have been built up over time. You know, whether before it molts or something like that, or it goes from one instar to the next or whatever. Kind of what I'm thinking of. So I'm going to pull this out a little bit. And I'm being nice and messy with it, because I like that. Let me pull some of this kind of stuff out. And smooth that. All right. And uh, maybe turn off symmetry and create a little bit of a asymmetrical kind of look here. Okay, so another technique I like to use is our bees looking kind of adorable. Um, uh, at this point, it's time to have a sip of beer. And another technique I like to use is clay polish. And I abuse this technique a lot. If anybody of you followed me before, you know that I use this all the time, probably too much, but I just wanted to demonstrate it because it could be kind of cool. So what is clay polish all about? So if I go into geometry and go over to clay polish, and I'm gonna use the default settings, but if I just hit clay polish, right, it's gonna do like an overall polish to, this, to the entire surface. So you saw, see how that detail kind of got knocked back a little bit because we just like hit the whole thing with a polish brush at once. And I like that because it does knock back the detail a bit and makes it look a little bit more organic. But the other thing um, that I like is uh, if I take a look here with the flat color, you can see that by hitting it with clay polish, it's left a mask here, a very, very faint mask just along the edges and just part of the noises. Is this part of how this this button works, right? So what's cool about that, go back to my startup material, I can hit control I to invert that mask. Again, very subtle, but you can see the lighter areas here, right there, that's unmasked, the gray and darker areas are masked, right? That's how masks work. I'm gonna hit control H to hide that, and then go in here with the inflate brush and I can turn on symmetry again. And now what I can do is because that mask is there, I can start to use the inflate brush to kind of bring out these details. And now you can see, I get kind of another interesting quality of detail. Maybe I'll hit with a negative inflate as opposed to positive. So I'm holding the Alt key and oh, it's a little bit too weird. It might not work in this particular case, Maybe it doesn't quite look the way I want it to, but it's always worth a try. But you can see how it's bringing out, this is what I like right here, this kind of weird organic edge. And then hitting it with a smooth brush, you really get this kind of like super organic 
bizarre alien kind of quality to it, which I think looks really neat. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's it kind of screws up the personality, the detail. But like I say, it's kind of fun to try. Then you get kind of a weird kind of pattern here. If, if I hit the smooth brush a little bit more, so I'm just alternating inflate and smooth, but you get this to me, I think that looks really cool. So it's just a matter of just playing around with it. Inflate a little bit, smooth a little bit, and then see what happens. Okay, so remember a few moments ago, I just hit with the damn standard brush. It just made kind of some vertical lines here. Well, now I'm kind of taking advantage of that to make it look a little bit more subtle. And then you can get this kind of thing. Or maybe hit the Alt key and get this kind of thing. It's just a kind of a cool way to make detail. That's one of the technique I definitely discovered totally by accident. You know, and then the first time I did it, whoops, sorry about that. First time I did it, it was like, wow, that's cool. And so now I do it probably too much. Maybe it's something I just want to do in a few areas here and there on the surface so it's not... Again, it's like if you have a variation in the intensity and the style of the detail across the surface, it's just much more interesting to look at than something that has kind of uniform surface detail. Uniform surface detail can, tends to give you that old school CG look where everything was like a bump map, you know, back in the days of the late 90s and all that kind of stuff. Early CG. I wish I would stop doing that every time I let go of the button. I got a 3D mouse. Let's use my 3D mouse. Nope, it's not working. So I'm just hitting that plate brush. I'm still using that clay polish mask, but this is kind of cool. See, that looks way cool right there. That's what I'm going at. So you can kind of see the way I do detailing. It's, it's really just like overlapping passes. That's too much. That takes advantage of, you know, things I've already sculpted from a previous pass. If I can incorporate it into a mask or incorporate it into um, that kind of thing. Kind of like what I was doing last... The last couple of weeks I was doing poly painting, but I was still sculpting a lot of detail where I was like taking advantage of a lot of detail that I'd already sculpted and using that as part of the poly paint. And that I'll, I would do the same thing for this, although with, with uh, the honeybee, it's gonna be a lot of dark browns and reds and very, very subtle variations in color, as opposed to like a hornet or a wasp that might be brightly colored. At least we're talking about the head here. Obviously the uh, abdomen of honeybees has those telltale stripes. I'm going to undo that because I think that I don't like the way that looked. Just dusting it a little bit with the uh, with the inflate brush here and there and then hitting it with a smooth brush. Right here along the edge, a little bit of inflate. I'm going to increase the Z intensity of my smooth brush a little bit. So, you know, I'm smoothing, but I still have that mask, that super fine mask applied. But I think that's cool. I think that kind of gives it this kind of quality that I'm looking for right there. And you can do this for lots of different types of, of uh, creature skin. It's kind of like by hitting that clay polish button, button and then doing this, I'm... Uh, I'm working with the stuff I've already sculpted, so if the personality of the details is very different, then I'm going to get a different result using this particular technique. But like this looks nice and organic and cellular. And so the question I was asked is, you know, when I'm doing detailing like this, you know, am I going strictly off of reference or am I improvising? And the answer is a little bit of both. You know, it's kind of like I'll go off the reference for a while for some of the larger details, definitely the forms as much as possible. 
And then I'll do sort of an improvisation, like what I'm doing right now with the details, and then go back and then take a look and see, you know, is I, what I'm sculpting, is that something that I'm really going to see in this particular insect, or if I started going off into the sci-fi world? Um, and if I've gone off in a sci-fi world, it's no big deal. I can go back and kind of just adjust and make changes. Like this right here is not very... It's okay. Eh, that's all right. But you can always just go back and forth with a smooth brush and then clear the mask and go in here and, you know, maybe take like a uh, H-polish brush and just knock back a little bit so it's not too much in your face, you know? That's kind of like where the head is at right now. Let's let's play with the mandibles a little bit, or at least one of the mandibles. <clears throat> and I'm gonna first I'm cold. Studio, it's cold at night. Okay. Yeah, about 20 minutes left or so. Um, I once, there's a, um, if you're here in Los Angeles, like I am, I encourage you to go wander on over to that there uh, Natural History Museum. It's a really great place. A lot of great scientists work there. Now, you guys probably go over there and say, dinosaurs, awesome dinosaurs. But, and dinosaurs are awesome. I'm not saying anything negative about dinosaurs. But, there is actually a very in, um, extensive entomology collection within the Natural History Museum. It's not always on public display. You'll see some of it on when they do their bug, uh, bug weekends whatever the bug fair which they usually do in the spring they'll bring out some of that collection and you actually get to meet some of the scientists so a few of the scientists there that i know is lisa gonzalez is one and she's pretty awesome she's one of my favorite people too um but also brian brown and brian brown is i believe the head of the entomology department there um in the world of entomology he's actually quite famous uh he is an expert on flies believe it or not Diptera. Actually, Lisa is as well, but Brian is the lead scientist. And so, um, he's a really nice guy, a really interesting dude. Um, I've worked with him on a couple of projects. I'd love to do more if time permits at some point, because he's really cool. Um, but like a lot of scientists, he's also got a very interesting way of giving feedback. And my favorite story that I've told before is I worked on a, uh, a model of a a forward fly for Brian and um, forward fly is a very special type of very teeny tiny fly they're pretty cool there's lots of different species but you know when I send him pictures of the model that I worked on he basically said that I had gotten some things wrong and other things very wrong and that's kind of a typical scientist they like to mess with you that way um, Typical way of getting feedback. So even when you have like all the great reference and everything, it's still wonderful to have an expert eye tell you if you're completely off. So you can hopefully fix things. So I, I, I'm just thinking of this story mainly because of how unbelievably wrong my mandibles were on the la previous version of this model. Looking at them now, I can see I was totally, totally wrong. And they're a very interesting shape. You know, if you look at ant mandibles, they're going to have actual teeth on them. Again, depending on the species of ant. Obviously, a leaf cutter that has these big mandibles with big, sharp, pointy teeth. And uh, for cutting leaves and things like that. But honeybee, not so much. I think it's more like a knife than it is like a saw. But also you can tell it's in, in, in it's a scoop. And the mandibles I had of my original bee were totally wrong because I didn't have a scoop. I had something that looked more like a shovel. 
maybe I'm splitting hairs here, but it's definitely not the right shape and definitely way too thick. This is such a much more interesting shape. And I'm just kind of going through here and kind of playing with some detail. And again, using that clay polish brush, sorry, not clay polish, TW clay tubes. Uh, TW is for Tomas Fiddle's box, so this is one of his brushes. He uh, streams occasionally, so you can always talk to him about where, if you can get one of his brushes from him. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Um, but I'm using this, again, as kind of like a sandpaper kind of thing, just roughing up the surface while at the same time kind of working on those forms, kind of bringing them out a little bit more. Again, you want to look at uh, look at reference. So you can see it has a row of hairs here coming out. You can see these little pits right here where hairs come out and some of these other lines. So I'm kind of messing with that kind of idea. You can see that So this is this edge right here. I'm gonna go in here and take my SK cloth. This really is my favorite part of the process. It takes a long time because there are so many different parts of the bugs, you know. I'm doing just all I've done tonight is just the head the eyes and and one mandible so you can imagine you know i still got to go to the thorax and all six legs i'm going to do th three pairs of legs there's also the wing veins um the muscles for the wings which is something that i'm always working on trying to get right i think this could be a little bit More like this. So it's a little bit straighter. Slightly pointier down here. I think I overdid this right here, so I'm going to go back with the clay tubes and maybe. Uh, just, I mean, I like the line overall. I like the detail it's getting, but it's a little bit too prominent. So I'm just going over here. Now I'm doing, in this case, the, the mandibles are arranged in a somewhat asymmetrical way. So I'm just doing one mandible at a time. You know, if I want to save time, I could just work on this one and then just li literally mirror it over to the other side and reposition it. I don't feel like making all the details on the other mandible as well and um, one way you can do that is using the uh, mirror function in subtool master this one right here the nice thing about the mirror function is that um, it will keep levels of subdivision so i won't lose all this work as opposed to you know, like a mirror and weld or just you know that kind of thing. it's just a nice plug to use i don't know what i'm talking about i'm just babbling at this point <clears throat> okay, I like that. Now what I want is I have a line that comes down here. Oops. I'm looking at this this kind of line right here. It's tough because it's also the angle that I'm viewing this at um, in the picture. Some some of these uh, forms are a bit more exaggerated than others, so like this curve, I think needs to be a bit more prominent. And then we'll go back with the clay tubes, TW clay tubes, and maybe bring this out a little bit more, these forms. This should have back face masking on by default, but let's double check. I'm not too worried about the inside of the mandible. 
Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that 2DW clay tubes to kind of soften this a little bit so that it looks more like a change in form and less like a line that's just been carved into the surface. So I'll do that a lot where I just like make a really obvious line just into the surface and then I'll come back with TW clay tubes and then just kind of soften it, round it a bit, make it look more natural. And that's definitely something that I've learned from Tomas. Um, the way that he sculpts been kind of changed a lot of the ways that I approach ZBrush. All right, so then I'll just hit it with a smooth brush a little bit. Overall, Let's see how that looks. Some, um, some ways that I do detailing that are not necessarily based on surface noise. The surface noise is nice because it's fast. You can get a lot of really cool detail on there really quickly. Um, but sometimes I'll design specific brushes and sometimes that might take me a while to kind of figure out what the right brush is. Maybe it's just a, something as simple as say, going to the Damien Standard brush and switching it to say drag rect and then going in here and you know pulling detail like this sometimes that works but maybe i want something that's a little bit more evenly spaced so maybe i'll choose a new alpha like this and there's drag dot if i want it to be consistent in terms of its size right i want to do like this is good for like beetle dots and that kind of thing um I'm just kind of demonstrating. Another, you can use the new drag stamp uh, stroke type. That's a great way to kind of keep things a consistent size but vary their intensity by dragging. It's a really nice one. Um, I'm going to make this a bit smaller. So just, yeah, because you can see how this quality is very different from this one. So again, it's a question of like analyzing the uh, the insect and seeing what kind of surface detail is really going to work. So this might be really cool for some parts of the model. Um, but that's a great thing about ZBrush. What I love about it in terms of its why it's my favorite digital sculpting tool is that the brush settings are so incredibly powerful um, that once you get... You don't have to know everything about the brush settings. You can know five or six tricks that you can throw out every once in a while and it will change everything. Or you can get really into the weeds and all the various brush settings and and just do amazing things. But I, it's always my contention that you can do pretty much almost anything you want to with a ZBrush brush if you can just get in there and mess with the settings enough. And I think that's the thing that makes set ZBrush apart from other digital sculpting tools. But I'm just kind of playing with some like like divots here and then maybe if that's too much I'm going to shift D to go down a little bit get my smooth brush and maybe smooth that out a little bit just to make it a little bit less obvious and then hit D to go up smooth a little bit more all right and then I can go in here and maybe uh, use that surface noise I think this is the one I copied and pasted it is so I'm going to use this, but I'm going to do mask by noise and then hide the mask. And I'm just going to use this in a few little places here and there. Maybe just along the edge here. Here and there. Let's make it look nice and organic. <clears throat> I 
and you can kind of see very faintly how that going over it with a clay brush has just created a nice wobble in the surface that is underneath all the other detail and just looks really nice and nice and organic. So let's say I have that going and I'm going to clear the mask. Let's do a just for fun. Let's go up here, our geometry, hit it with a clay polish, invert that mask, control H to hide the mask, and then I'll go in here with the inflate brush again. And you can see, maybe bring that out. Is it going to work? I don't know. Let's see. That's kind of cool. You get this kind of like cracks in here and then smooth it. I use the smooth brush. It's probably my favorite sculpting brush. I use it for everything. And bring out some of those lines and smooth that. And there you go. You know, the final version of this, you know, um, I'm a big fan. I use, um, if I'm going to use this in an animation as opposed to a 3D print or something like that, um, I still use, tend to use Maya because I've used it for 20 some odd years. Oh Christ, uh, sorry. Oh Buddha. I've used it for actually 25 years. I just realized that. Um, so that's a long time. Um, but I still tend to use it. I think Blender is awesome. I don't necessarily th think Maya is a million times better than Blender. I just know it better. Um, so a lot of times I'll rig this for animation in Maya. I'll render with Redshift and I'll use Yeti for fur. I like Yeti. I think it's it's got the tools that I think are the easiest to use for fur. So um, eventually this honeybee will be covered with fur and a lot of these details you're going to see just underneath you know, between the hairs, even on the mandibles, you'll find a lot of hairs. But it's like if you can catch it in that specular highlight, that's what makes it look really realistic. So I'm going to clear the mask there and just smooth this out a little bit more. So it looks kind of weird. Whoops. Clear the mask. There we go. All right. So here's a head and one mandible. Still lots to go on the torso, I mean the torso, the thorax. The thorax is a really, especially in honeybees, is just a, such a beautiful shape. But you can see there in the scan data, there's a lot of separation here in the plates that I have to draw in here. And I will do that, I think, next time. You can see the wings need a little work here. We have this, this little plate right here over the muscles. The anatomy is not quite in there yet, but it's almost there. So I'll continue to work on this next week. Um, or sorry, the next, uh, sorry, I don't know exactly when I'm going to do the live stream again, so I will make an announcement once I pick a time. So the next time I do a live stream, I'll stream, I'll continue with the honeybee. I hope that this has been helpful and everybody's enjoyed it. Once again, as always, apologies for the technical issues at the beginning. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. A couple things I want to point out. Um, if you want to know more about how I do insects, you can visit thenomenworkshop.com. Assuming it ever opens. There we go. Um, if you take a look, if you browse by instructor, okay, yes, and they've got 15% off. Okay, cool. I don't want it right now. Um, browse by instructor. Uh, here I am, Eric Keller. And I have several DVDs, sorry, DVDs, several videos series devoted to insects. Uh, I have the hyper-realistic insect design, so this is an older one. I kind of made up a wasp here, but I still think it's still relevant. I think this is rendered in octane. Um, and then I also have a more recent one, which is this is a mantis. So it's quite a few chapters and I go through 
Z brushing, modeling the ins the uh, mantis from scratch, doing all the details, um, and then doing the poly paint UVs and actually doing the shaders in Marmoset. So um, you can check that out, and then you can also check out. Speaking of fur, I have a jumping realistic jumping spider that I did again. ZBrush. This one is ZBrush. Uh, Redshift for Maya. Maya and Yeti fur. So a lot of my techniques and a whole lot of chapters. And then of course uh, also as I mentioned before Entomology Animated. Um, check out my video series on insect vision because I spent a lot of time on it and I think it's cool. Um, a lot of ZBrush in there. And I also have a section on Entomology Animated where I have some YouTube videos or links to my YouTube channel which has uh, more insect stuff on it. So time lapse of this beetle and my Emblypigid and my damselfly. So a few things on the YouTube channel. And um, you can also check out uh, the past streams where I've worked on some of this stuff. So if you're really just desperate to hear my voice or you could call my twin brother. He sounds just like me but he'll just make stuff up. Um, once again, thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the stream and I will see you next time with more bugs and spiders and things like that. Um, all right, see you next time.